Okay, good afternoon and welcome to this session on the first day of the workshop. Uh, we will be talking about effective teaching and learning strategies in um, science and engineering classes, both introductory and intermediate, but I guess since this is CS 101, we will make sure that the focus is on those topics. Okay. So, here is a roadmap for today, okay. uh, what we will be doing for the rest of the afternoon and we will start off by discussing some problems in the teaching learning process and soon after consider strategies for that and by the end of today's workshop you will be able to identify some of these strategies, device activities based on strategies, work with each other and a few more things. Okay, so this list of some possible problems actually came out of the previous two workshops that we had done for instructors in CS101. And since we had live participants right there, we had a very interactive session and we will try to make some of this interactive later. But this actually came from your colleagues and in fact if the coordinators are there, you might recognize your own words in this list here. That when we are in the classroom and we are teaching, one of the biggest problems we have is that we have students of all kinds of levels, motivation, interest, etc. And the question is what do we do about it? The common complaints that came up the other day, the other two times were that students might be bored and one really common thing is that they mostly care about getting good marks and that is not wrong at all, but we have to deal with that constraint. So what do we do and if we want to talk about effective learning, deeper learning, conceptual understanding, how do we reconcile that with the idea of getting good marks. And finally from the teacher's side, one refrain that kept cropping up was, we all know these problems are there, but how sh what should I do in spite of all this? I am interested. Some of you said, some of you said, well, what, how, how should I, what should I do with the interest level? So what I'm going to do now is uh, just flash another slide where it, we can see that there is no single prescription for good teaching. All of us know that, and unfortunately, I won't be able to give you those answers right here today. But what we do have is some guidelines and later today we will see about uh, where these guidelines come from, what is the basis of them, etc. But here is a list of some guidelines, okay. That we do need to take into account specific individual students as well as populations as a whole. And there is a reason I have put them in this order right here, you will see in a moment. Regarding the, uh, the previous point about students tuning out, etc. There is one thing we should be doing and that is to set expectations early, emphasize them often, frequently enough. And the last two questions are really the most important questions and that is where we will start from. One is what are the students goals and it could just be that the students goals are getting good marks. Some students have other goals also, we will see about those and we will see how we can, uh, how we can address those. But the last question is where we want to start from, that is what are your goals as a teacher. And the reason I put this slide right here was I wanted to put the problems and the guidelines right next to each other. Because when I was thinking of these, I thought well there has to be some sort of mapping between the problems and the guidelines that we were talking about. So the last one here, how do I prepare in spite of all these problems really goes back to the question as to what are your goals as a teacher. So that is where we will begin this whole session. And let me ask this question slightly differently again. What are your goals? What I am trying to ask is what do you want your students to take away from the day's class? So one typical answer which we get, which most of us give when we try to see what we want students to learn is by saying well in today's class we will be dealing with section 2.3 from the textbook. And if you actually look at those, that section, you will see that it looks something like this. The major topic could be, for example, in CS101, data representations. And if you look a little further into the subtopics, you will see words such as integer, floating point, etc., etc. But what we really want to do today and from now on is to go from a set of words, which, which just are words or phrases, into something more specific, more detailed where we know exactly what we should expect of the student, to what level, to what depth and what the performance outcome of the student must be. So I put this together, this is in fact jumping many slides ahead, but here is where we will get to by the end of today. 
that something that looks like a series of words here can be rewritten in a few sentences where things are more specific. So if we are talking about floating point representations, what we really want the student to be able to do is write the syntax for defining a floating point variable, which means we want the student to say float x. We also want the student to understand what this x really means. And if we, th if we want to go deeper than that, or if we want some students to go deeper than that, we want them to be able to explain how internally float x is represented, uh, how this variable is represented into the computer. So the, these kind of, this list of goals is what we call as learning objectives. And the first question we can think of is by asking ourselves, what's the point of doing this? Why, why are we trying to get so excruciatingly detailed? And why should we think about this in so much depth, so much detail? And really, there mo there, there's many reasons you will see uh, today, at some point we'll see it, is that both teaching and learning is a systematic process. And we want to try to approach this in a more systematic, scientific-like process. So this is, these are just words here. And we'll see again why, uh, what we really mean by these processes. So um, in order to prompt, or in order to guide us further on how to make teaching and learning into a more systematic process, how to make, how to write these learning objectives in a more uh, detailed way, let's look at a few questions. Now, the original question we had earlier, what do we want students to take away from class? Instead of just dropping a few phrases, we are trying to ask more detailed questions, such as what skills, knowledge, and attitudes do we want our students to develop? And based on that, how, what will we do to the structure of our co content? How will we, what resources will we use in class, out of class for homework? And finally, how will we assess our students' learning? And what we'll see is that when we start writing these learning objectives, assessment becomes much, much more easier and much more uh, systematic again. So let's start looking at what exactly these learning objectives are and how to write them. Mainly, we want to spend the bulk of the time in the first hour on how to start writing these. So learning objectives indicate specific performance outcome of the learner. And here are some which are not learning objectives. So understanding pointers, appreciating object-oriented program, knowing data structures, all these we claim are not learning objectives. And I want people at this point to take a minute to think as to why we put these under the don't. Okay, let's do an experiment. Let's see if anybody wants to attempt answering this question. So why are these under don'ts? Why are these not learning objectives? And okay, would anybody from ASC Bangalore try to think about? Hello, Sangeeta. This is Dr. Sangeeta from. Okay, so Dr. Sangeeta from ASC Bangalore wants to say that these are not well defined and they are not measurable. So that might be one reason why these are not learning objectives. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sangeeta. Let's move on. We'll come back to you. So there we are, that these need to be specific and they also need to be measurable, okay? And one more, let's look at one more thing which we try to avoid when we write learning objectives. So often when we make notes for class, we say something like, today I will arrange, I'll have a lecture on character arrays. Or if you're teaching a course on ecology, you might say, today I will arrange a field trip. And the claim is that these are not learning objectives either. And here again, we want to look at this last word in the sentence as to what a learning objective is. That when we say we arrange a lecture, or arrange a field trip, or give a lecture, we actually have the teacher in mind and not the student. So instead, what we want to do is say something like, the student at the end of this lesson will be able to do something. So they have to be concerned with the learner and not the teacher. And our colleagues from Mission 10X will be talking about learner-centric instruction uh, in the next few days. So you'll hear a lot more about these. So 
what we have in this chart is somewhat of a prescription as to how you would go about writing learning objectives. The center box here where we say that we formulate the learning objectives using action verbs, identify, list, describe, etc. This, this should give you a hint. And in fact, the second box down here is where you would start from, that the student will be able to do or the student will be able to explain something. So we'll come to examples in a few minutes. But before that, what I would like you to do at each of the remote centers is the following. So we're going to have activities. We'll try to make it interactive. But in the absence of interactivity, we'll at least have the activity part. So first, turn to your neighbor. And uh, if you don't know each other, introduce yourselves. Because you have to do this task together with your neighbor. The task is that this is the first class you'll be teaching in the topic of arrays. And you need to write two learning objectives for that. We'll give you a few minutes for that. And after that, we'll ask you to share your learning objectives. So whoever is ready, please uh, yeah, just be ready. We will request. You can request for uh, floor time. You can raise your hand, and our cameraman will put you over. So let's say two or three minutes for this activity. Periyar wants to share some of their learning objectives. The learning objectives. Uh Related to arrays, the learning objective uh -huh. I am giving as follows to understand the purpose of arrays, creating, storing elements, traversing elements, the significance of index. The first one said that. One learning objective is to understand the purpose of arrays. And the second one was to create uh, uh, create an index array elements. I'm sorry if I got that not exactly correct. So let's look at this one by one. And the first one was to understand the purpose. OK, let's try to go back to the previous slide. At least let me remind you. What we wanted to do is to indicate a specific performance outcome, which means we wanted to say that the student should be able to do something. Now, when we say that we want the student to understand the purpose of arrays, let's use some of these action verbs to just restate those. And we can say something like, the student should be able to explain why arrays are important. And the reason, the difference between the two, when we say that the student should understand this, is as a teacher, how would we know if the student understands it or not? Whereas if we say that the student should be able to explain it, it's very clear what we expect from the student. Would any other center like to share their uh, ideas? Thank you, Periyar. Any other center? Let's say uh, ASC Amritapuri. Hello, Amritapuri. Yes, please. Hello, Ray. Hello. I'm saying just the purpose of the array or the objective of the array, we should uh, explain the students regarding the um, objective with an example, like when we want to store the data in a bulk in contiguous location or in consecutive manner, something like that. Okay, what Amritapuri wants to say is that instead of just talking about the purpose, we also need to talk about examples. For example, uh, such as if you want to store the data elements uh, in a contiguous ar array. Now, again, I want to remind our goals for instruction, which is also asking the same question as to what we want students to take away from the day's class or at the end of the unit. What we are really saying is that the student should be able to do something and show us something which we can clearly measure and assess at the end. So we want to think in terms of the student and not the teacher at this point. So maybe let's move on and look at a few more examples, and this idea would become clear. OK, uh, maybe one more center. SGSIT Indore say we, that you have some answers. Yes, there need to be more practical real world examples. OK, so what would the, the comment from Indore is that we need to have more practical and real examples. And what I want to ask you to do is to write a sentence that says, the student should be able to fill in the blanks. The student should be able to use uh, they should know where the array is required, in fact. OK, the student should be able to say where the array is required. OK, give examples of places where arrays will be required. That would be a learning objective for this, uh, for this topic. 
Okay, so let's keep going on with a few more examples. Hello, I'm Pushpa from uh, GSITS Indore. Okay, hello Pushpa from Indore. First, we should tell the students what is the limitation of a single variable and then we should uh, tell them the purpose of array, how it will suffice that, uh, that actual need. After that, uh, the syntax should be given to the students and then an example. Okay, so what we hear from Indore is that we should uh, start from the limitations and we should start from the limitations and only then go into more details. Limitations of a single variable and that kind of leads me to my next slide. Okay, let's look at the question as to when we have different learning objectives, are they all at the same level? Are they all created equal? And this is something what I heard from some of you that we need to do something first and then only then we need to do the other. So I put the three objectives that we had earlier for floating point variable. The first one said write the syntax for the variable. The second said describe the meaning of this syntax. And the third one was to explain the representation, the internal representation of this in terms of binary, etc. So you will see that there is some sort of hierarchy and increasing level of complexity when we are talking about learning objectives. And some of you in fact have brought this point uh, in your answers. So this hierarchy actually comes in the form of a classification and the classification is known as a learning taxonomy. It was developed by Benjamin Bloom in the 1950s in the US and essentially what it is is a increasing order of steps where we try to classify a topic or classify knowledge and we say that initially we need to look at the lower or lower steps and only then move on to the higher steps which also involve the lower ones. Okay, we have a question here from uh, Salem. Sona College? Okay. So the learning objective of array is first, uh, uh, first we give the meaning of an array, after that we give the syntax for an array, and then give more examples, and then how to declare the arrays, so these are the learning objectives, and lastly, so we identify the uh, representation, internal representations of an array. So these are the learning objectives of array. Okay, so we had some examples of learning objectives of arrays from S Sona College in Salem. And again, what they say follows this hierarchy that initially we need to start with the definition of an array and then we need to do some explanations, then give examples and only then look at the internal representation. So again, you are getting the point here that there is a hierarchy. And SVNIT Surat also would like to share something. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, uh, regarding that uh, learning objective for that array, uh, my suggestion is that uh, before going to start array, we first give some uh, real-time problems that's related with array. Okay. So, uh, SVNIT Surat, in fact, is, uh, is reading my mind in the sense that they're talking about slides that I'm going to talk about after half an hour. So they want to talk about some examples and some real life examples. We will come to that in a few minutes. In fact, in a few slides. So I'll come back to you. About yeah, one real more life examples. There. One more yes, query is there. Yeah, regarding the pointers. Yeah, before we explain them the uh, points about the pointers as such, it would be better and appreciated if we explain them as such the functioning of the pointers just through the concept of how the contents are get stored as in the form of envelopes. So okay. what you access is the contents. Okay, so uh, the, po the question here or the comment being made is that we want to look at the conceptual understanding of an array or a pointer before actually describing it further. Okay, so what let's go back to the different levels. Um, We'll give you lots of chances to speak in the next uh, couple of hours. In fact, uh, m m much of our session has to do with activities and questions coming from you. So we were talking about the different levels of learning objectives or different levels of knowledge as we go along. And this is in a series of six steps according to this one hierarchy. The first one we call as knowledge where all we are saying is that how would you recognize something, how would you recall facts? Typically, questions that fall into this category, 
start with define, identify, list, cite, where all you're asking a person to do is uh, trying to recall something that they already have heard before. The next higher level we call as comprehension, where we are talking about meaning, interpretation, explanations, descriptions, etc. And right after this series of six steps, we'll see examples. The third level we call as application. And here's where it gets interesting, because we want to use knowledge that has been, that we've already thought of in the knowledge and comprehension levels, but apply them in a new situation which involves some principle or rule. So again, typically questions which satisfy this objective start with the words apply, calculate, solve, predict, and so on. The next three levels are really more sophisticated and more complex. And unfortunately, we never get to these at the college level. Well, I wouldn't say never. We rarely get to these at a college or school level. But when you're talking about practicing engineers and scientists, these are the levels that they want people to talk about. So we have something called analysis, where you take a whole, separate it into parts, and understand what each part, how each part relates to each other. Be able to look at the relationship between the parts and how you put them all together. The level that comes after this we call as synthesis, where it's the opposite of analysis, in the sense that you take little pieces, put them together to make a whole. And Synthesis usually involves a lot, some creative behaviors, planning. So questions that we can ask in this level start with words like design, device, create, and so on. And I want you to take this slide really seriously because very shortly we'll be asking you to write questions. The final level, according to this scheme, is something called evaluation where you judge the value of something based on specific criteria, you make decisions, etc. Now, the two things you want to see in this chart, one is that there is an increasing level. We already talked about it. But let's look at, say, a level that is uh, analysis. Now, in order to do analysis, we have to know the facts, which means the knowledge level has to be included. We also have to be able to understand. We also have to know how to apply a rule, etc. So the higher levels include each of the lower levels in this hierarchy. So this was a little bit of theory to help you go. OK, we'll move to the activity right now. Since we were talking about arrays, uh, I'll keep this slide on. And now you have to do, you have to work in groups. I would suggest groups of three or four. So just switch your chairs or move around. And what you want to do is write assessment questions. Because finally, we are interested in knowing what the learner wants. Write questions in each of these levels in the topic of arrays, since we've already talked about arrays. So the way you can do it is use the action verbs on the right-hand column and come up with questions in the topic of arrays for each of these levels. Just to give you a hint, the f and you want to go from bottom to top. To give you a hint, define is one of the first action verb there. So how would you write a question on array which uh, refers to the knowledge level using the word define. So this activity, in fact, you can take a few minutes, about four to five minutes, and work in groups of three, come up, write six questions, one for each level, and then you can share it with us. If you'd like, we can start discussing level by level. OK, we already have a few responses. And we also have a question from Amrita. OK, so let's go level by level. We have one question at the, we have one question at the knowledge level from Amrita. And their question at the knowledge level is very specific. They say, define a one-dimensional array. This is a very typical knowledge level question in arrays. OK, would you like to add one more question? You were saying something? OK, another knowledge level question in arrays could be, define a string in C using a character array. So typical, these are typical knowledge level questions where you have define. Let's look at, let's try to think of a comprehension level question. OK, we have a question at the comprehension level, which says, explain how the different 
array elements are stored in a memory. And again, it's good that you're using these action verbs. They give you a very good hint as to how to frame these questions. The moment you say explain how these array elements are stored, it's more than recognizing a fact. It's more than re recollection. What you have to do is to do, you have to grasp the meaning of how these are stored and be able to articulate it. So yes, this is a comprehension level question, how these array elements are stored. Some other center, would you like to share a comprehension level question? Uh, let's hear from Nanded. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, Nanded has prepared a question for the evaluation level. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. And the question is, evaluate the performance of evaluate the performance of one and two dimensional array in terms of memory usage and CPU cycle time. Can you please repeat the last three words? Yeah, ma'am. Uh, I will repeat the whole question. Evaluate the performance of one dimensional and two dimensional array in terms of memory usage and CPU cycle time. Okay, thank you. So, th this is an evaluation level question from Nanded. Evaluate the performance of one dimensional and two dimensional arrays in terms of memory usage and CPU cycle time. So, the reason this question falls into the highest evaluation category is that in order to answer this question, a student has to know what 1D and 2D arrays are, be able to explain the differences between those, uh, be they, they also have to understand how each of these affect memory usage, how each of these affect CPU time. They have to take the performance of each of these arrays and analyze how, uh, how the memory is used. So each of these first five levels is used in this evaluation question. And that makes it into, uh, that's why this question can be classified as evaluation. Uh, you said you had one more question, Nandit. Design two-dimensional array using two arrays. Okay, the question is design a two-dimensional array using the syntax of two one-dimensional array. So what sort of a structure would you write to create a two-dimensional array if you had two one-dimensional arrays? Yes, this would be a synthesis level question. Uh, in fact, this might have been one of the questions that we have written in our own example. I have to look at the slides later and see. Uh, any other center wants to share questions at the different levels? We are receiving from Somaya, Mumbai. Okay, the question is, if you have a two-dimensional array to begin with, how would you copy this, the elements of this two-dimensional array into another array? Thank you for all your questions. These are really good questions and it looks like people are getting the idea of it. Does anybody have an application level question? We have ASC Bangalore here. Do you have an application level or some other question? Hello, I'm Santa Lakshmi from ASC Bangalore. Hello. 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 Yes, what is, yes, your, what question? is your question? For an application level. In our application level, just by giving some code snippet, we are asking them to find the output for the following code. Excellent. So the question in the application level is that we show them a code, a snippet of a code, and ask for the output of the code. Thank you. That would be an application level question because people would have to use their rules in a new situation, which is a new code that we are showing. So thank you AC Bangalore and I think what we'll do next is just run through our questions and you will see that a lot of these are familiar and in fact you have covered most of these questions. So let's start from the knowledge level very quickly, one slide back. And this is again something that all of you mentioned. Uh, good afternoon, we have, uh, we have SG SIT Indore. Indore wants to ask a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, my question is: uh, Can we create an array of length zero size? And if yes, then why we create a? Uh, 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 compiler allow why allow the length of zero size array? Can we create an array of length zero size? So here is a question. Uh, 
Yes, I can hear you. The question is, can we create an array of zero size? And I want all of you to think about, if you ask this question, at what level, uh, this, or at what cognitive level you would classify this question on? Yeah. And ma'am, I have another question. Uh, ma'am, if we uh, create an array of length n size, then uh, we use index 0 to n minus 1. But if you in, we use index uh, more n or more than n, so it's a uh, uh, how what happened? It's a compile time error or runtime error? Okay, so the question has to do with compile time errors and runtime errors, and can we create an array of zero size? And this would probably be an evaluation level question. So what we'll do at this point is show us our examples, and then maybe take one or two more centers. We have another two hours to go. So if you don't get a chance to give, your, give us your questions in this particular, for this particular activity, we'll come back to you in the next activities. So let's look at some questions and we'll go through these really quickly since almost all of them have been covered. Next slide. Uh, okay, hello, let's take one last thing. Uh, hello. Yes. Just one question was there uh, that uh, can one array be copied into another array? Mm -hmm. So I want to answer for that. It's very simple when to copy the contents of one array into under another one. Just declare two arrays of the same size like A of 5, B of 5 we have declared. Then get the content in one array either from the user side or you can initialize at the time of declaration only. So Suppose in the array A you have some values, then to copy these values into array B, what can be done? Only take the for loop and with the help of for loop, you can copy one by one the elements of one array into uh, uh, another array. Okay, th okay, thank you Symbiosis. What Symbiosis is trying to do is answer some of the, one of the previous questions about copying one two-dimensional array into the other. And since the answer was very long, it will be hard to, para to repeat verbatim. But to paraphrase, what I can say is that they were trying to apply the different, the, or they were trying to find out, uh, um, or apply the different parts to the synthesis and the analysis to answer this question. So again, let's go through some of the slides and we'll take questions later. So if you could please hold off your request for a few minutes. Let's go through a few of the slides and we'll transfer the floor to you at the end of this. And uh, since there was a little bit of confusion, let's start at the knowledge level again. We had defined an array in knowledge, in comprehension, we wanted to find out, or we, some of the questions we thought of was, how is an array referenced? Okay, this was again a question that did come up. Or we can ask, explain why an array is required. And I think this question did come up from one of the participants. In the application level question, we can ask students to write a program. For example, a program to find the maximum of a certain number of, uh, maximum of n numbers. And as you're looking at the questions again, think about why we have classified these into application or comprehension and so on. So let's look at an analysis level question next. This was exactly the question that uh, one of you asked. We, uh, we show a program, a snippet of a code, and we ask what's the output of this program. Now depending on how intricate this program is, we may be able to classify it as both an uh, application as well as analysis. Depending on how much of the breakdown one needs to do in the code, it could be classified as analysis. Let's look at a synthesis level question. Um, it says, suppose you have an array of numbers containing an unknown number of elements. How would you devise an algorithm to sort these numbers? Now, I know that the, uh, some of you want to say, give answers to these that go beyond arrays. But what we want to try to do is stick to one topic and see how within that one topic we can push the depth so that people are able to uh, design and devise new algorithms sticking to the same topic. And finally, let's look at an evaluation level question. In fact, there some very good questions came from the participants. But one of the questions we thought of is, is it always useful to have arrays and give examples where arrays may not be required or may not be useful? And the activity that should have come next, we've already done earlier. So what we'll do now is pick another topic in CS101, in programming. We've talked a lot about arrays. So what I want you to think of is pick any other topic that you will teach. Again, in groups of three or four, or maybe if you have a smaller center, the entire group, 
write similar write assessment questions for each of these levels and okay we will give two minutes per center and we will start with the centers that have not got a chance to present their answers so far. So, let us say about three or four minutes new topic not arrays and uh, please write these questions. For the new activity where you had to write questions for the new topic please raise your hand again if you have something to share. Okay, we have one from Indore. So, we would like to uh, broadcast Indore so that we will see what they have to share. Yes, uh, Madam we have thought about structure as an example. The, the topic, topic is structure, please go ahead. The topic is structure. Yeah, uh, uh, we started with knowledge where uh, we ask the basic questions such as what a structure is, how do you define it and who all can be the members of structure. Okay, so the question, this was a knowledge level question on what this, what is a structure, excellent question, please go ahead. Yeah, the basic one, the knowledge level, this is how you recall the fact to the students. Okay, do you have more levels in structure? Uh, then we have tried for the comprehensive level also. Okay, the comprehension level question is? Where we, where we ask questions why structure is important because it is in a position to store the heterogeneous members okay, so where in array we are just uh, limited with the homogeneous members. Okay. They are asking a comprehension level question where they, you have to think about the difference between an array and a structure. Okay, maybe one more question and yeah. Then we have thought about the application level also. Okay, application where, question. Uh, we asked the students how to store the details of a customer. How to store the details okay. of a customer which comprises of the customer name, number, his address, telephone number and birth date also. Okay, excellent. So to store the details of the customers you would need to apply knowledge in a new situation using principles etc. So that would be a application level question. Thank you. So, any other center who have a new topic? Uh, Let us look at NIT Suratkal because I do not think we have heard from them earlier. Taken a topic as stack for our analysis. Okay. Hello. Yes, yes please, please go, go ahead. ahead. Hello. Uh, madam, we have taken stack as an analysis for this thing. For the first level of knowledge, we, uh, we have a question which goes like this. What is a stack? Okay, their topic is stack and their knowledge level question is what is a stack? Do you have anything, do you have a question in a higher level? For example, analysis or synthesis in stack? For analysis, we have a question which goes like this. Define how you can use stack in recursion. What is the role of stack in recursion? So, they want to ask questions about using stack in recursion for the analysis level. Okay, please go ahead. And for next level evaluation, we can evaluate how you can make a comparison between recursion and iteration and which one is far better whether using a stack which uses recursion or whether going for a iteration. Okay, this is again a very good evaluation level question because they want to try to compare recursion and iteration uh, in a specific situation and see which one is better in which situation. Okay, any other center wants to share a topic? Thank you, Suratkal. Uh, let's let's look at Government Engineering College, Thrissur. Function, functions is our topic. The topic. And, uh, uh, knowledge level. The question is. Function, functions. The topic is functions. Topic is function, functions, and uh, the knowledge level. So, a uh, question is uh, define function. Okay. Next level. Define a function. Okay. And uh, next, uh, the comprehensive level. Uh, describe the concept of a function. Okay. With an example, that is, includes function. Declaration, 
the definition call all these things okay this is really a very good distinction between knowledge and co comprehension because in knowledge you talked about definition of a function and in comprehension you talked about description of the conceptual level along with an example okay please go ahead concept of function yeah uh, there's a application application level so write a program to calculate the factorial of a number using function okay writing factorial of a number using functions is an application level question yes, and the uh, analysis level so differentiate the different methods of passing arguments to a function and and uh, synthesis level write a program to passing an array to a function uh, for this uh, application level let, let me comment upon a couple of these at the application level you are you wanted to write a program to find out the factorial now when you say that at the synthesis level when you say that you want to write a program to pass an element or an array to the uh, to the function what we are doing again is using some rules in a new situation what we are not doing is creating something new so while your application level question really fits the category I, what, I, what i might suggest is that when you're trying to pass an uh, pass an element to a function you're again applying rules in a situation and when you're thinking of synthesis what you really want to be doing is uh, creating either a new new rule or putting two things together where the whole is bigger than parts etc or uh, maybe you're trying to create a new data structure that would be a good synthesis level question okay thanks let's look at uh, vnit nagpur uh, uh, hello uh, is it possible to use recursion without iteration the question is is it possible to use recursion without iterations so what we can do is if you want to comment on each other's question you can write these questions down and we will try to have some more sessions later or you can think you can type these in and send us or we can talk about this tomorrow so at this time i would request all of you to focus on the activity and instead of commenting on uh, instead of trying to answer each other's questions we have 22 centers that we are trying to coordinate here let's take one more coep pune uh, question on comprehension is explain pointer to a function with its syntax and example the third question on application is write a program to sort numbers using pointer and the question on analysis is differentiate between pointer and array the question on synthesis advantages of pointers over array let me interrupt for a moment here uh there there was a question about the advantages of pointers over arrays in fact that is a very good evaluation question okay please go ahead okay the last question on evaluation is what are application of pointers okay so uh, your questions some of them might be categorized into different categories for example when you are thinking about the advantages and trying to compare one structure over the other what you're doing is uh, judging two things or making decisions based on criteria so we would classify them more as evaluation than as synthesis please go ahead uh, evaluate the effect of pointers with respect to security of data okay another evaluation question is evaluating the evaluating uh, pointers regarding the sec security of data okay uh, thank you um, what we'll do at this point is take a 10 minute tea break and then we'll continue the session